This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. After a week of street protests here in Uptown Charlotte back in September, how do we look to other people around the country and how does Charlotte look to ourselves? I'm Jeff Sonier, stick around, we'll have details. Plus, a closer look at the link between childhood obesity and disease, what you can do to help children develop healthy habits for life, and... Women played a significant role in the success of the Allied victory in World War II. I'm Jeff Rivenbark, and I'll have a local woman story. Don't go anywhere, Carolina Impact starts now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. For every city, there are those moments, both good and bad, that we all remember. Events that bring us into the spotlight, whether we want it or not. And Charlotte's had its share lately. The Democrats holding their national convention here four years ago, the Panthers playing in the Super Bowl last year, and most recently, the police shooting that set off street protests and rioting in Uptown, with national audience watching. Carolina Impact's Jeff Sonier is uptown with more on how others see Charlotte and how we see ourselves. Well, yeah, we all watched it on TV in September, and no, it wasn't pretty here in uptown Charlotte. Right before our eyes, the Queen City turned into the mean city, the sending the troops to intervene city, the protests like we've never seen city. <laughs> The crowd was much larger than they had expected. That they had a bullhorn. Where's the damn video at? It must have been, gosh, I know five or six hundred people who were gathered down there in Marshall Park at that time. But Pastor Dwayne Walker says the marchers who started the night here at the park and then moved to his nearby church on the edge of Uptown, they weren't looking for trouble, they just wanted their police department complaints and their city hall complaints to be heard by the entire city, loud and clear. Black Lives Matter! There was an outcry. Mm -hmm. And then where there's already some uh, lack of trust in our uh, uh, police force, um, anyway, then that did not help the matter at all. Everything kept moving down the street, and the next thing we knew, there was about 800 to 1,000 people right out here in front. And Matt Allen, who manages the Hyatt House Hotel, he says that's when things started to get ugly. We had some guests that were peeking out through the windows and everything, and then some would start hitting the windows, and then it just escalated from there. They started picking up bricks from the from the outside and just started throwing them at the windows and breaking all of them, so. I think what was kind of jarring, I guess is the word I would use, um, for folks who live in Charlotte is what they saw wasn't a Charlotte that they were really familiar with. Well, I, Jeff, I think what you saw is we boiled over as a city. Michael Smith is president of Charlotte Center City Partners, which works with the Charlotte Chamber to promote Charlotte's image. We are an inclusive community. Everyone gets involved, everyone feels the ability to have a voice, then everybody's voice is listened to. The truth of the matter is, we have had our hand forced, and we've been forced to look at ourselves and to look at what we haven't done well, and no matter how much we've tried, we failed at this stage. And what the rest of the world saw happening in Charlotte in September, and what triggered it, well, that's more than any Charlotte image campaign can fix. There's a group that's been left behind, and that's the group where Charlotte can do better work. And what was, what was highlighted on TV is a small percentage of our community, but it's, a commu it's part of our community that's the most fragile, and that uh, would benefit from an intense focus. I understand the lack of trust in the police department, but in this case, because it was a black citizen shot by a black police officer who was defended by the black police chief, it doesn't really sound like racism. Really? Okay. It does to you. Well, the thing is, is that when we think about racism, we say, well, because another black person was involved, then it couldn't be racism. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. 
you know, racism is not just about uh, white, black versus white. It's a matter of a system and how people are dealt with differently, how they're double standards that are applied when black people are involved. A lot of us before September thought what happened in Ferguson, what happened in Baltimore would never happen in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll see more protests in the future? If there's no change, if there's no change, and I, and I think there's gonna be some change, something that has been horrible, and maybe something good will come out of it. Something's happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. Which brings us back to the There's sidewalk outside Matt Allen's then battered and boarded up Hyatt House Hotel, the day after the protesters moved out. That's when the artists moved in. You know, let's see how creative you can be and let's, you know, try to bring the city back to normal. And from there, it just, it took off. There were so many people that I talked to that came out here that said, you know what, I'm not, I don't protest. I'm not gonna get out and march the streets, but this is one way that I can get involved. A thousand people in the streets singing. There was even a gallery showing in South End featuring the protest art as Charlotte seemingly embraces the problems it faces. stop, children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. In reality, you know, we're probably not quite the queen city we thought we were before September, and we're certainly not the mean city we look like during September. So going forward, well, how about this? How about something like Charlotte, the somewhere in between city? Amy? Thanks, Jeff. By the way, if you're interested in seeing more of the protest artwork created on those boarded up windows at the Hyatt House Hotel, the Levine Museum of the New South on North Tryon Street is planning an exhibition. And the hotel itself will permanently display one of the largest protest artworks in its lobby, the same lobby where all that protest damage took place. Well, shifting gears now to health news. Childhood obesity can lead to serious problems later in life. Obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. It's almost impossible to talk about one without the other. Carolina Impact's Danielle Koser explains the importance of developing healthy habits at a young age. Nice. They're only four and seven years old. <laughs> but Graham and Nolan are already training to become all season athletes, shooting hoops and scoring goals. Play soccer. Um, and run around and play with the dogs. Three, two, one, go! When it comes to exercise, it's all hands on deck for the Elkins family. Oh, oh, Graham with the sliding finish! For us, being outside in the yard is our favorite place to be because we're really together and we're having some fun, healthy competition, but also working as a team. For this busy mom, staying active isn't just about staying in shape. Here it comes. Take a shot. So it gives us more energy to stay focused for our work. It gives us more um, energy to be with the kids and involving the kids in the activity is just so great for our family to spend time together. She hopes an active lifestyle combined with a healthy diet. Bananas, grapes, strawberries, blueberries. Will help keep her kids from becoming a statistic. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, obesity affects more than 12 million children and adolescents. So about one in three will qualify as overweight or obese. Data shows obese children are more likely to have risk factors for cardiovascular disease, such as high cholesterol or high blood pressure. There's no question about it. The most common cause I see of high blood pressure is a person who's overweight. Hey, good afternoon, Cameron. Hi. How are you doing today? Dr. Ann Walker has worked as a pediatrician for nearly 30 years. During that time, childhood obesity has more than doubled in children and quadrupled in adolescents, according to the CDC. It's huge. We like to say it's ballooned significantly. Dr. Walker starts monitoring her patient's blood pressure and screening their cholesterol at age two before most kids are even potty trained. So we're looking at cardiac health prevention in primary care from as young as we can actually effectively look at that person. But cholesterol screening in kids is somewhat controversial. 
Earlier this year, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force released a report saying there's not clear evidence to support screening children and adolescents for high cholesterol. When you actually try to look at the data and see, are we saving lives by screening for cholesterol, that's a tough thing to prove. Dr. Matthew Brothers, a pediatric cardiologist, says families should adopt a heart-healthy lifestyle. Dietary changes, uh, regular exercise, routine checkups with the primary doctor. The American Heart Association offers six simple steps to help you get started. Find free time for activities. Make time in your schedule to get moving as a family. Make a weekly meal plan and stick to it. Simplify your family's schedule so you can have more time for the things that matter. Take baby steps. You don't have to change everything at once. Work as a team and encourage kids to help prepare healthy meals. And parents and caregivers should live by example. We've always tried to model good, healthy behavior, and I think for us it's all about balance. So we're definitely a household that indulges in treats and good food when it's appropriate, but we also are all really active. We exercise almost daily. Oh, good move, good move. Well, what we try to talk about is that this okay. isn't just the child's condition. The child doesn't buy the groceries, the child doesn't make those decisions for the house. It's a family, it's a community thing. It's empowering parents, um, trying to undercut the enabling. According to the CDC, obese children are more likely to become obese adults, which can lead to serious health problems like diabetes and heart disease. If you start younger, then we are worried that uh, we'll see more and more uh, young heart disease in their 30s and 40s. Pediatricians play a big role in their patients' health, educating kids and equipping families with the knowledge they need to help fight childhood obesity. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Costa reporting. Thanks so much, Danielle. If you want to know how to figure out if your child is overweight, first, you need to calculate their body mass index, or BMI. You can do this using a simple online calculator, and we've posted one just for you at pbscharlotte.org. Well, joining me now is Dr. Mark Higdon, a primary care physician with Novant Health. Dr. Higdon, thanks so much for your time. We so appreciate it. It's good to be here, Amy. Thank you. Help us understand, when we start out and our kids already have challenges if they're overweight as children, I would suspect the odds of them being overweight as adults is probably a lot higher. Absolutely, and, and of course, childhood obesity is becoming essentially an epidemic now. It's something that uh, uh, pretty simple to overcome if we could just get our uh, teenagers off of the video games. I'm the father of three sons, uh, 14, 16, and 18, and, and one of the biggest things, we want to get them outside and playing. There's, there's several things uh, right now, 60 minutes of exercise each day, and that's something to start with for, with each one of your children. So. so by the time then we get them to adulthood, let's talk about some of the things. Can we really reverse pre-diabetes or diabetes? You know, there's a fair amount of evidence, and, and when you consider that there's 30 million or 10 million diabetics in the United States, about 80 plus million pre-diabetics, which are in that stage just before we have to start treating for diabetes, it's certainly something to, that we would want to do. Diet, losing about 10% of your body weight, if you weigh 200 pounds, that's 20 pounds is something we would want to do. We want to make sure that we modify our diet. And everyone wants to know, they say, what's the best diet out there? Yeah, one that I can recommend. Secret. You know, there's no secret diet. Research will show that. One that's good is a Mediterranean diet where we decrease, we, you know, the amount of meats that we eat. We increase plant foods. We replace our butter with either uh, canola oil or um, olive oil. We make sure that we eat fish and chicken at least two times a day or two times a week. And we also make sure that we get our exercise. And exercise is one of the biggest ways that we can prevent diabetes and other car diseases such as cardiovascular disease. Recommend about 150 minutes of exercise each week, 30 minute periods of what we call moderate activity. That's basically a hard walk. Uh, you can also do 75 minutes if you like to work out a little harder, and that's a, that's a pretty brisk jog. Do that for 25 minutes three times a week, and you're getting the 75 minutes that we recommend. So 75 minutes a week. It's, uh, we do get a little break from the fact when we were kids it was an hour a day. Indeed, and, and of course, <laughs> this is adult exercise, but for the children, it's mainly just getting them out outside, you know, and they'll find things to do. 
uh, certainly a playground. Uh, any uh, organized sporting activity uh, far exceeds the exercise that they would need. So uh, those are good places to start and certainly our schools have some great athletic programs. And when we talk about that pre-diabetes and diabetes, the reason we're so focused on it and so concerned is that it really leads to a lot of other chronic diseases. Absolutely. Diabetes is, is can be a devastating illness because of the things that it is associated with, cardiovascular disease, which is heart attack and stroke. Uh, and most everyone is affected by that. My family is affected by diabetes. Also, diabetes uh, has the potential to cause blindness. It's a leading cause of amputations. It's a leading cause of kidney disease and kidney failure in the United States. And so it's certainly something that we want to focus on with trying to uh, uh, reduce, if not eliminate. What's the number one tip that you would want people to understand if they could just do one thing to improve their long-term health, what would it be? Eat more plants. Eat more plants. Do we have to give up our meat in general? You know, you don't have to give up meat, but uh, you want to do that in moderation. And certainly uh, there are recommendations out there to drastically reduce. And it's, it's the way we prepare our meat a lot of times that is part of the problem. A lot of fried foods and things like that increase the fat content. And so we want to try to avoid that at a, it, every time that we can. Go into the grocery store, uh, basically pick those foods that are very colorful, and, and that'll be a good way to start. Uh, we used to... Uh, uh, it was in the service and we would talk about sleep activity and nutrition being the things that we wanted to focus on and certainly that's true here now. So I guess the real answer is that we are empowered. We can control our health. It's up to us. Uh, we choose what we put in our mouth and certainly that would be a, a true statement. So, Great information. Dr. Mark Higdon, primary care physician with Novant Health. Thanks so much for spending time with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Amy. Well, for many, North Carolina is considered the barbecue capital of the world. But the Tar Heel State has two very distinct types of barbecue. The Lexington, or Western style, is tomato-based. The Eastern style is vinegar-based. Many years ago, I worked in Greenville, North Carolina, and fell in love with that kind of barbecue. Regardless of your preference, thousands flock every October to the annual Mallard Creek barbecue. In this week's Carolina cooking segment, Jason Turzis gives us an inside look at the area's largest and longest running one day barbecue. It began as a small family gathering, but has grown into an annual tradition so big, it's received national attention. A church benefit meal that raised $89 its first year now raises tens of thousands for charitable causes. Some of the traditions of the annual Mallard Creek barbecue have remained the same for generations, while others have changed significantly. Barbecue is no longer cooked in underground pits, but the chopping process from decades ago remains the same today. The stirring of the Brunswick stew back then is identical to the way it's done now. And what was once a very formal gathering with women in dresses and men in suits and ties is now very casual. For 87 years, the fourth Thursday in October has held a very special place in the hearts of the members of the Mallard Creek Presbyterian Church. My parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents started this church. It all began in 1929. The church was having difficulty paying for a newly constructed schoolhouse. The idea, hold a barbecue to raise money. They had a, a building debt that they wanted to pay off is in the, the depression, the beginning of the depression. They raised about $89, paid off the debt, and uh, that's how it all got started. I think that first year it was a pig, a goat, some chickens, and we would raise money to buy this land and this four-room schoolhouse where my father went to school. The barbecue was such a success, church members decided to make it an annual event and helped out in any way they could. They would um, buy the pig, and that was kind of their donation was to raise the pig, feed the pig, they bring them over here, slaughter them, and cooked it in pits in the ground. As the barbecue grew and the amount of meat too great to cook in the underground pits, the cooking process changed. These days, wood gets tossed into burn barrels. As the wood burns, hot coals drop to the bottom of the barrels. They're then scooped out, brought inside, and dumped into the specially made pits. The meat is then put on large grates and covered with roofing sheets to hold in the heat. That allows the meat to slowly cook. Once done, the meat is pulled off. It's then chopped and sliced and sent through the grinder, where it's churned up and churned out. It's then spread onto large tables, where vinegar and cayenne pepper is poured over and mixed throughout. Once fully seasoned, it's put into tubs and loaded onto refrigerated trucks out back. 
A similar chopping process is used to make the coleslaw. The work is all done by volunteers, many of whom are church members, and many of the specific jobs get passed down within families, generation to generation. If families worked on the stew and doing it, their children, their grandchildren, that now their great-grandchildren are helping out with that. The only key is you have to find your own replacement. So I'm looking, if anybody wants to take my place. <laughs> The only people who do get paid are the women who stir the famous Brunswick stew. Using huge black pots and giant paddles, the women work in very hot conditions. But Charlene Harris has developed a way to beat the heat and pass the time. Even when I stir my bump is true, I talk to it, I dance to it. It makes it good because when you're happy, it makes your food happy. So how does one church feed 25,000 people in a single day? It's a process involving lots of planning and lots of volunteers. We have about, I'm guessing, 20 departments. Everything from parking to trash. It may only be a once a year event, but it runs like a well-oiled machine. Volunteers are everywhere, from those loading up plates to those pouring the stew, moving the to-go boxes, working the drive through line, and even handling the propane. There's a person in charge of each department, and they're responsible for that job and getting their people. When you have cars lined up four wide back out to the street and even up the street, things had better run smoothly for those dining in, at the takeout line, or at the drive through We get people in and out quick. The barbecue has also become quite popular with local politicians because the timing of the event lines up perfectly with election season. I've lived in the area for 32 years, and every year I would always see the traffic backed up. And just over the years, it's been a thing where politicians started showing up here and there, and now it's, it's well known. I think it's great because it gives the people the opportunity to come and talk to us. The 2016 barbecue had 500 volunteers. 25,000 people were served. That's over 14,000 total pounds of cooked barbecue, including 7,000 sandwiches, 2,000 gallons of Brunswick stew, two tons of coleslaw, and 200 gallons of coffee. Tens of thousands was raised, with proceeds going to Hurricane Matthew relief funds in eastern North Carolina. When Hugo came through, money went there. When Floyd came through, all the money went to Floyd. Well, it makes you proud to know that people can come together, work together for a cause, not just for the church, but to help other people out. The Mallard Creek Barbecue started as a family event 87 years ago to pay off church debt. It's still a family event, only now the family is much larger. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Churches reporting. Thanks, Jason. If you missed this year's fun, don't worry. Plans are already underway for the 88th annual Mallard Creek Church Barbecue in 2017. So, you know, Mallard Creek Barbecue was just in its 10th year when America entered World War II. During the war, the U.S. government launched a campaign to recruit women to join the munitions industry because there just weren't enough men left to get the job done. Carolina Impact's Jeff Rivenbark introduces us to a Charlotte woman who, along with millions of other women, did her part to help the war effort. December 7th, 1941, Japanese fighter planes, bombers, and torpedo planes attacked Pearl Harbor. 90 minutes later, more than 2,400 Americans were dead, nearly 1,200 wounded. The attack thrust America into World War II. Back in Charlotte, Dot Horn had just turned 18 and just finished high school. I was going to King's College, taking uh, sectoral uh, training at that time. During the summer of 1943, there was a growing need for women in war industries, and Horn wanted to do her part. Well, the first thing I did, I took a civil service exam. In four days, they called me and told me to report to Morris Field. Morris Field was a small Army air base in West Charlotte, used to train pilots and maintenance of aircraft. Horn and other women went to Pennsylvania for additional training to work on these planes. In the mornings, I took uh, blueprint, learned to read the blueprints. Then, in the afternoons, worked with, learned how to use the drills, the rivet guns, and learned what a generator was and what air compressors were and how they worked. A few months later, she returned to Charlotte and started working on military aircraft. And sometimes I'd be lying across a rod in the back of the fuselage bucking rivets. And sometimes I would be on the top uh, with the rivet gun shooting the rivets. I would just fill my mouth with the rivets and I'd pull one out and put it in the hole and pull another one out. 
An old newspaper photo shows Horn repairing a plane. I was working on a glider, which we only worked on very, very few of those. All the day long, where the rain does shine, she's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory, Rosie. The riveter keeps Horn and more than two million women worked in war industries, building ships, aircraft, and weaponry. Rosie the Riveter became a cultural icon, representing women who rolled up their sleeves and performed factory jobs once considered man's work. And we would had big sheets of metal that we would cut and drill the holes in it, and we had to learn all the terminology of the uh, plane. While most buildings at Morris Field have been torn down to make room for improvements at Charlotte Douglas International Airport, the original hangar at the end of runway 18 left still remains. The deadliest war in history dragged on for six years and ended on September 2nd, 1945. We all got uptown and we took over the streets and we marched the streets and it was just, it was just so wonderful. It still brings tears to my eyes till today. It was just a great time when that war ended. At 93, Horn's filled with pride when she remembers what she and other women of her generation did for the country. I felt like that we could, women contributed. I think it would have taken a lot longer to get that war over if the women hadn't stepped forth and gone out into the workforce uh, because they were just not men left to do it. It was an era of history that America pulled together and I, I know that there'll never be another time like that. Without a doubt, women like Dot Horn played a significant role in the success of the Allied victory in World War II by joining the industrial workforce when their country needed them most. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Rivenbark reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. If you'd like to hear more stories like this from other people across our region who played a role during World War II, make plans to watch Trail of History, Tuesday, December 20th at 8.30. Well, before we say goodnight, we want to remind you to friend us on Facebook for a chance to win monthly prizes. This month, we're giving away a pair of tickets to see Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood live coming to Charlotte January 22nd. All you have to do is like our Facebook page. We'll pick the winner Friday, December 16th. If you don't win, you can still get tickets by supporting PBS Charlotte. You'll find all the details on our homepage at pbscharlotte.org. Well, thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.